So I'd like to um, move on to talk about uh, preeclampsia screening uh, next. It's really another controversial area in uh, screening in pregnancy. I'd just like to talk about the current status uh, as of uh, 2016, late 2016. Now, I'd like to start by talking about principles of screening as outlined by the World Health Organization in 1968. Uh, now, to justify a screening test for a particular condition, a certain set of criteria must be met. And this was first proposed in 1968 by the WHO. Uh, firstly, the condition must be an important health problem, and it has to have a recognizable latent or early stage. Secondly, there must be a suitable test or examination which is acceptable to the population that is being screened for. And thirdly, there must be an accepted treatment for patients with recognized uh, disease that is being screened for. And lastly, the screening program has to have appropriate facilities uh, for diagnosis and treatment that is economically justifiable, which is continuing process rather than a once for all project as you might expect with some sort of uh, supplementation type uh, uh, pro uh, project. Now let's first assess uh, the first criteria. Is preeclampsia an important health problem and does it have a recognizable latent or early uh, phase? Now looking at this slide here, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are a big problem in world health. Uh, when considering causes of maternal deaths on a global scale, 15% are directly related, as you can see here, to preeclampsia. And in developed countries, uh, it affects about 5% of all pregnancies. And it is a leading cause of maternal deaths, uh, being responsible for up to 10 to 15% of mortality related to hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in general and, in, in, and eclampsia. It is a leading cause of perinatal deaths. It causes 5 to 10% mortality related to preeclampsia and eclampsia. It is a leading cause of complications associated with prematurity and uh, neonatal intensive care unit uh, admissions. Now, in its severe form, preeclampsia is a multi-system disease. And you can see in the placenta, it causes infarction, abruption, uh, and subsequently in the baby, it causes intrauterine growth restriction, hypoxia, preterm birth, and eventually fetal death and perinatal death. And in the mother, in the central nervous system, it can cause seizures, strokes, edema, blindness, um, and eventually hemorrhage as well. It causes coagulopathy, ca causing hemolysis and disseminated intravascular coagulation. And in the lungs, it can cause pulmonary and laryngeal edema. And in the liver, it can cause HELP syndrome, jaundice, ultimately liver failure, and in the kidneys, tubular and not cortical necrosis, and ultimately also renal failure. Now, if the health impact of preeclampsia is dissected, what can we observe? We can observe two very important facts. Firstly, that IUGR is strongly correlated with preeclampsia in the early gestation. Have a look at this. Um, sorry, have a look at this graph on the left here. Um, on the x-axis, you have uh, the uh, percentage of women who are pregnant who have preeclampsia and IUGR, birth weight under the le less than the tenth centile, which is that's how it's defined. And you can see that the great majority who, uh, of women who have IUGR uh, will also have preeclampsia uh, up to about 70 to 80 percent, up to 30 to 32 weeks gestation. From 34 weeks gestation onwards, the correlation between preeclampsia and, and intrauterine growth restriction uh, decreases to approximately 30 to 40 percent. Now, secondly, in this second and third uh, graphs here, it shows us that the earlier the gestation of delivery, i.e. the more premature the delivery, the higher the perinatal mortality. Now this is of course obvious, with more premature uh, babies, they're more likely to die. And you can see that the, on the x-axis here for perinatal mortality, uh, in terms of percent, described as percentage, um, uh, up to about 26 weeks as a high perinatal uh, mortality after 28 uh, weeks onwards, much lower perinatal mortality. Now in this last slide it shows maternal mortality. Now that's a little bit uh, interesting because mo maternal mortality is also higher uh, 
when premature delivery occurs, when preeclampsia is present. You can see that at gestations below uh, 32 weeks, the maternal mortality is also increased. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that preeclampsia is really a heterogeneous disease that probably has two subtypes, an early onset and a late onset subtype. Now, this fact is now widely accepted. Early onset uh, preeclampsia is a severe form that is defined by an onset under 34 weeks gestation. It is regarded as a fetal placental disorder and it carries a significant health impact uh, with high perinatal mortality, extreme prematurity, severe intrauterine growth restriction and adverse maternal outcomes, including death and permanent morbid sequelae. And it affects approximately 3 per 1,000 um, pregnancies. Conversely, late onset uh, preeclampsia is a mild form uh, of the disease, which is defined uh, by onset after 34 weeks gestation. It is regarded as a maternal disorder and it carries a lower perinatal mortality and it has a low risk of prematurity, a high chance of a normally grown fetus with much more favorable maternal outcomes. And it affects uh, about 4 per 100 pregnancies or 4% of pregnancies. And the only effective treatment of either sets uh, of uh, preeclampsia is by delivery. So these facts we know. Now, what about the pathophysiology of uh, preeclampsia, in particular the early onset preeclampsia? Here is an image um, of a pregnancy implanting itself onto the endometrium, so that being the endometrium in the maternal uterus, a group of trophoblast cells, and this is the gestational sac uh, beginning to form. So what happens in normal placentation? There is, in normal placentation, in this diagram here, this is uh, endometrial cells, and these are trophoblast tissue. In normal placentation, the endovascular invasion of uh, maternal spiral arteries, which are these arteries um, that you can see sort of here, uh, they are deep and they cause the vessels to dilate and it increases the vascular compliance and therefore increases the placental blood flow. However, in abnormal placentation, you can see that these maternal spiral arteries are much narrower, they have uh, much reduced compliance, they're much shallower and sometimes none at all, and so superficial uh, to nearly absent. It causes the vessels to be stiff, uh, which limits placental blood flow. Uh, this in turn causes placental hypoxia, a release of inflammatory cytokines, causing platelet and endothelial dysfunctions, and ultimately to all the clinical symptoms and complications of preeclampsia that we see uh, described in the earlier slide. So therefore, what we can say, uh, the first criteria is clearly met. What about the second criteria of screening? There must be a suitable test uh, which is acceptable to the population that is being screened for. So let's have a look at what tests are available. Now current evidence shows that by combining the parameters that alter preeclampsia, uh, i.e. maternal characteristics, uh, biophysical markers in the form of mean arterial uh, pressure in the mother and uterine artery dopplers, and biochemical markers in the form of pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and, and placental growth factor, uh, that the risk of um, pre early onset preeclampsia uh, can be determined. And by combining these factors, women can be assigned into high risk whereby they get started with aspirin treatment and blood pressure monitoring and if they're assigned low risk uh, they can uh, go on to have uh, regular blood pressure monitoring to detect late onset preeclampsia. Now what maternal characteristics are we sort of talking about? Um, so here is a um, forest plot of uh, maternal characteristics uh, uh, that uh, alters the risk of preeclampsia. Now this dotted line in the middle that demarcates zero is the no effect line. So any um, uh, parameter that you see that has a dot in this line uh, shows that it doesn't affect preeclampsia risk. Any dot with its 95% confidence interval lines that appear on the left side of the line is a negative risk factor, meaning it increases the chance of preeclampsia. Anything to, to the right of the dotted line 
and decreases the chance of preeclampsia. Now, advanced maternal age is clearly a risk factor. Uh, increased maternal BMI is a risk factor. Um, decreased BMI is a protective factor. Uh, racial origins uh, from the African uh, Caribbean racial origin is an increased risk factor. South Asians also increased risk factor. Uh, a poor uh, previous obstetric history affected with preeclampsia also increases the risk. However, a previous pregnancy that was not affected with preeclampsia lowers the risk of preeclampsia. If the mother had preeclampsia, that increases the risk. Conception by IVF increases the risk. And certain maternal uh, medical disorders of chronic hypertension, uh, diabetes mellitus, and uh, SLE also markedly increases the risk of preeclampsia. Now, we know all these things. What about biophysical markers? What are we talking about in terms of biophysical markers? Now, we remember um, this diagram earlier that, uh, that illustrates the pathophysiology uh, of uh, early onset preeclampsia. We can uh, use this uh, pathway to detect um, certain changes. For instance, we can use um, the uterine artery Doppler studies where increased resistance can increase uh, the risk of preeclampsia. And we also talked about how we can measure the mean arterial pressure in, in the mother uh, to determine whether they're, they're at high risk or not. And because of the decreased uh, placental vasculature and therefore decreased placental mass, the biochemical markers of pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and uh, placental growth factor uh, also decreases, uh, which can be used as a marker uh, for uh, preeclampsia screening. Now, when we talk about screening tests, as we've seen in previous uh, talks, that we will assign a screening test a certain false positive rate uh, and its screen positive rate. Now, when we look at preeclampsia screening, if we use maternal characteristics alone without the biochemical or biophysical markers, we can see that for a false positive rate of 5%, we would be picking out approximately 35% of women with severe uh, early onset uh, preeclampsia. However, if we look at adding mean arterial pressure uterine artery dopplers and a biochemical marker, we can potentially increase uh, the detection rate to 82%, uh, which means most of the population being able to be screened for severe early onset preeclampsia, which is associated with a high morbidity and high perinatal mortality. So clearly, the second cri criteria for screening is also met uh, because there seems to be a fairly suitable test and the test only involves an ultrasound, a blood test, um, and measuring the blood pressure. So it's a fairly non-invasive type of a screening test. So what about the third criteria? Is there an accepted treatment available for uh, severe early onset preeclampsia? Now, we looked at the mechanism of action um, of the path or the pathophysiology of preeclampsia before. So what does aspirin actually do? The mechanism of action of aspirin is a little bit unclear. However, it is thought to work at two levels. Firstly, it is thought to improve the uterine artery blood flow, uh, thereby improves the transformation of the spiral arteries, causing it to have a deeper invasion and be uh, become um, more compliant uh, to normal levels. And secondly, it probably acts as an anti-inflammatory um, and therefore improves platelet uh, function and therefore uh, decrease the plethora of symptoms of preeclampsia that we talked about earlier. The evidence of aspirin usage in uh, severe preeclampsia is summarized again in a forest plot uh, that showed, uh, uh, it's a really a meta-analysis that showed uh, a number of studies in this uh, 2013 study. Now the primary outcome measure was perinatal mortality. In this first slide here, um, these are the studies with treatment instituted after 16 weeks gestation. Now, you can see from this um, line down the middle, which is the line of no effect, meaning aspirin has no effect uh, on severe early onset preeclampsia uh, after 16 weeks gestation, the great majority of studies had confidence intervals or uh, median uh, values that were either useless or had a negative effect uh, on severe early onset preeclampsia. Uh, 
and cumulatively the data shows really absolutely no effect of aspirin treatment after 16 weeks. So what we're saying here is that if the woman has been detected to be at high risk of severe preeclampsia and if treatment is instituted after 16 weeks, it is completely useless. What about the evidence um, of aspirin treatment before 16 weeks uh, gestation? Now the data is a little bit more promising here. You can see a trend towards a reduction in perinatal mortality. Um, with the no effect line uh, being here, and you can see with all these studies, there is a trend towards uh, protection against uh, perinatal mortality when instituted, when aspirin is instituted under 16 weeks uh, gestation. However, most of the confidence intervals you can see here, they do cross the no effect line, making the results a little bit unclear. And when you can look at the cumulative data, the level of protection that aspirin offers, even when treated early in pregnancy, is really mild uh, and probably quite uncertain. Another thing regarding this meta-analysis is that only 600 cases of severe preeclampsia here was studied uh, amongst all these meta-analyses and there were only seven cases of perinatal uh, mortality that was attributed to early onset uh, preeclampsia. So clearly the evidence is still not uh, very certain at this point. Therefore, it follows that the fourth criteria is clearly not going to be fulfilled as a screening test cannot be implemented in the absence of adequate evidence for its use. So I'd like to, to draw a couple of conclusions um, regarding preeclampsia uh, screening and its status today. So universal screening for preeclampsia is not ready for widespread use today. Although there, the screening protocol appears to be effective, the evidence for treatment is not robust and there is therefore no accepted screening program. So the evidence for benefit of early aspirin treatment is still mounting. There is a large aspirin trial that is currently underway by the Nicolaides Group in London and it is expected to be published um, early to sort of mid next year. And therefore we would expect updates uh, very soon. And it is very likely that consensus statements will likely appear from colleges and other governing bodies to guide us as to how best uh, to use preeclampsia screening, but presently it is clearly a test that is still finding a, play, a role uh, for our current um, uh, screening protocol, and we will certainly keep you updated if changes uh, arise. Now, thank you very much for your attention.